very briefly, monitoring started with the Clean Air Act in the U.S. So the Clean Air Act required EPA to set up monitors in population centers to monitor for the five criteria pollutants named in the Clean Air Act. And um, those are ozone, PM, lead, NOx, and SO2. So those five pollutants were mandated that we monitor. So what EPA did is set up a system where we give grant money to the states to operate and maintain the monitoring networks, and then the state and local agencies actually do the monitoring. And um, because we're funding the monitoring, they're required to send the data to EPA so that we can figure out if they're in attainment of our national ambient air quality standards. So the Air Now program came about because we had this vast monitoring network that was being used for regulatory determinations. We realized that monitoring network could also have another use, which is to inform the public. So we came up with the idea of Air Now to take that same monitoring data and turn it around within an hour so that the public could get real-time information. And from that, we morphed into forecasting because the public not only needs to know what the data is right now, but how to plan their activities for the next day or even several days following. So we supported the state and locals again in coming up with air quality forecasts to inform the public about upcoming conditions. The communities are mostly the recipients of the data in the U.S. Um, the state and local monitoring agencies actually gather the data. But where Air Now comes in is that data used to be very hard for the communities to get because it went to our regulatory data system. And the process for getting access to that system was, it was open to the public, but it was difficult for the public to actually go through all the paperwork and get accounts on that system. So when Air Now came about, it was about the time the World Wide Web was really beginning to take off. So we put the information directly on the web for the people. So the communities can get that data now, whereas it used to require Freedom of Information Act requests or getting an account on a system. It was very difficult to get. The biggest challenges, I think, are getting the air quality agencies to come together and submit all the data for a particular country. In the US, um, state and local agencies actually gather the monitoring data, and we didn't have a regulatory, um, we didn't have a law that said they had to submit it in real time to AirNow. So the challenge was, can we get them to participate voluntarily and give them some added value? It turned out they really were um, into the concept because it gave them access to other states' data so they could get a national picture, and also it highlighted the importance of the monitoring data. The public actually got to see what the monitoring people were actually doing. Um, in developing countries, what we found is sometimes the political structures are a little bit different. Um, there may be a meteorological department that runs monitors, and maybe the environmental department's in a different ministry. And so some of the challenges we have are getting everyone to come together and communicate and um, try to get the, a national data product that the entire public can use. Shanghai was our first AirNow International partner. So what we did is we basically said we're going to rebuild the AirNow system. And then at the end, Shanghai will adopt it and the US will adopt it. So what we learned was um, we had to develop multi-language support, which the entire AirNow system had been written completely in English. So we had to add multi-language support. We also learned the Chinese had their own air pollution index. So we had to build in support for multiple indices. Not everyone uses the US AQI. And we learned that um, in Shanghai, particularly the organization of environmental organizations can be different. Um, we worked with the Shanghai Environmental Monitoring Center, which is a provincial government. And so we also had to coordinate with the ministry at the national level. Whereas in the US, EPA is kind of at the forefront of environmental protection for the whole country. There is no one number for that because monitor placement has a lot to do with monitoring objectives. Um, EPA kind of went after a population objective, so we put our monitors in centers of population. And then underneath of that is kind of what are you trying to measure? Are there heavy industries that you want to site a monitor near? 
are there transportation corridors? So a lot of the siting is done based on what the state and local agencies expect to see in terms of pollution and then also to protect public health. So unfortunately, there's not a single number in terms of ideal density. Um, I think usually people think you can put one monitor per a certain radius and it just doesn't work out that way because of topology and monitoring objectives. I think that kind of plan would require a lot of coordination with the Delhi authorities because we'd need to understand the transportation patterns, where the emissions are, um, understand more about how PM 2.5 develops in the city. So unfortunately, there's not a clear answer that I could give you. It would be a process where we'd have to sit down and talk about local conditions. Um, it would take quite a bit of research to figure out exactly where all the monitors would go. Yes, um, a lot of companies are coming out with sensors. You know, the traditional sensor in the U.S. costs a minimum of, of about $100,000, and then the maintenance is very high. So some companies have seen a market there where they've created sensors that are in anywhere from $500 to $5,000, which is much less than a regulatory sensor. So EPA is watching that very closely because we want to see how accurate these sensors are. And what we're doing right now is we're doing a two-year field study where we've taken a lot of these sensors and put them in the same location as a more expensive regulatory monitor to see how they perform. So until that's done, we won't really know exactly how accurate they are and how reproducible the results are. But we're very excited about the concept because I think it could lead to a lot more data points and also obviously community groups will be interested in monitoring where they live and work. There's not a lot out there yet because they're so new that there just hasn't been enough time to do a good data analysis of how they're performing. Um, there is one ozone sensor that EPA has approved as a federal equivalent method, which basically means it measures as well as the reference monitor. Um, that one is not exactly a small sensor. It's not the kind of ozone instrument that the average citizen would carry around, but it is a smaller cheaper version of an ozone sensor. So we've actually approved that one as uh, equivalent to the reference method. Yeah, and we're trying to, we're trying to decide um, after this two-year study, when we, when we see how well they perform, then we'll be able to kind of take that next step. It's, they're gonna, we're still talking about certification processes, and we just don't know how good they are yet. So it's going to take time.